Welcome to 78.4, the podcast that helps you leave a godly legacy for future generations by showing you incredible things God has done in the lives of men and women around the world. If he can do those things in these people's lives, imagine what he can do in yours. I'm Bob. And I'm Matt. Well, we did it, Bob. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we made it to the season finale of season one. We need some kind of fanfare. Yes, let's 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 hope that people are cheering. Oh, not cheering. They don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. We get to be done. No, but and then sadly, uh, just so the audience knows again, the listeners, I, I'd love to high five Bob on that right now, but uh, since we're recording from miles away, because we're still in the midst of this never-ending COVID quarantine, I cannot. Yeah, and it's it's not never ending, but it I does feel not. that way. Yeah, <laughs> it, it feels that way. I'm sure everyone, it feels that way, and we can't wait to get out. And and hopefully, when this ends, our plan, of course, is to come back for a season two later in the fall. As far as exactly when that is, will kind of depend on when this pandemic ends. So we're looking now, we're looking at September. Uh, right, if, that's the hope. God willing, we will will be back uh, with season two in September. Right. So look look for us then, and if you're subscribed, you'll just you'll get the next one when it comes out. So that's a smart thing to do. So, uh, but for now, let's enjoy one more time together before the break. So, I'm sure you're asking yourself, what is this final episode about? First, thanks for asking. <laughs> Second, we're going to talk about how you can be the difference in this world. If ever there's been a time where we can see plain as day the difference one person can make, it's right now in the time of COVID-19. Right. You know, one person with the virus can go out and infect scores of people. Mm -hmm. Or on the flip side, how about the medical professionals, the first responders, the doctors, the nurses, who are risking their lives every day to take care of the sick? One doctor one nurse, one first responder, they are making a difference in so many people's lives. Or if you want to bring it even closer to home, think of the difference one person has made in your life. You know, maybe it was your parents or your grandparents or a teacher, even a bully. <laughs> think of somebody who has made a difference, either positive or negative, in our lives. Right. So, so how do we take kind of like everything we've talked about this season and actually put it into action to be a difference maker, to make an impact on the world for God. And an even bigger question might be, is Christianity even the best way to make a difference in the world? And as always, we will hear from three people who have asked just that question and hopefully leave you with the kind of spiritual roadmap to follow after this. Our first guest is Jim Wonder. Jim saw the condition that the world was in, and he wanted to make a difference. He just didn't know how. <laughs> right. I never knew a time where I was not going to go to college and become an engineer. And so now I'm in college, and I am practicing, you know, studying to be an engineer. But this was the 70s. It was a time of we put men on the moon, look what engineering can do, and our culture is falling apart as the seams, look what engineering can't do, and why put men on the moon when this isn't working? So much to my mother's, uh, I, I, she never forgave me for this. I switched from engineering to psychology uh, in my junior year because I wanted to make the world a better place. I was frustrated with a broken world. <laughs> I was frustrated with a broken gym. Uh, and how do... Uh, what do I do with me? What do I do with the world? I'm trying to understand myself. Uh, I stuttered as a kid growing up. And I was often the brunt of people's jokes. And I hated that. And that was part of this whole mo 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 motivation as I saw this. But what really was hardest for me was as much as I hated being the brunt of people's jokes, I'd make fun of others. So how could somebody who hated it, who was abused by it, do it? And I couldn't understand this thing inside of me that was both noble and ignoble at the same time. How could I go from being kind to one person to being 
so unkind to the next in a breath. And that's what I was looking for in psych. I was looking for understanding me, uh, and then hopefully through that understanding, then what we can do to make the world a better place. I affectionately say this. Uh, in my freshman level psych courses, they said, we have all the answers. In my sophomore level psych courses, they said, we have most of the answers. In my junior level psych courses, they said, we have some of the answers. And my senior level psych courses, they said, we don't even know what the questions are. And if they had done that one first, I'd have never gone into psych. And in the process of all of that, uh, I didn't find answers there. And there's a guy named Jim who told me about Jesus. I thought he was crazy. But the more I argued with him, the more I realized he had what I was looking for. And in my junior year, God radically changed my life. And I discovered uh, at that moment the reason why I could be great in one moment and dastardly the next, and that's, I was created in the image of God, and so I'm like God. But I'm a sinner who is selfish and thinks only of myself, and so I can be mean. <laughs> and what I could never find in psychology, I found in Christianity. Then I led some friends to Christ. We started a small group. My golly. It not only worked for me, it worked for them. And the more I shared my faith, the more we led groups and did things, uh, the more I saw that everything that I looked for in psychology to make the world a better place, I'd found in Jesus. And that if I could be involved the rest of my life in letting people know who Jesus is and how they could follow him and, and be changed by him, and that I could actually work to make the world a better place. That's God's job. And that God is actually going to do that. <laughs> uh, but what I can do is work to help people know how to live in a better way in a broken world because more and more and more culture is realizing that no matter how well educated you are, if you don't have character, uh, it's not gonna make the place a better place to live. So for me, you know, I entered this like 40 some years ago, 44 years ago to, you know, to help make the world a better place. And I have found that through Christianity, through meeting real people's needs where they are in real ways, that we can make a real difference in their worlds. Uh, there was one community, this is in Guatemala, uh, where one of the teachers, she said, I gotta tell you my story, I gotta tell you my story. And so she only spoke Spanish, so we got a Spanish translator, and she goes, in my neighborhood, we had one killing like a week, in our neighborhood, I have three grandchildren. I never let them play outside. Since we started teaching Jesus as a role model in the schools, we haven't had a single killing in the neighborhood and my grandchildren now play outside. Christianity makes a difference. It may not, until Jesus comes back, change the world. But in the worlds where it's allowed to work, it makes a difference. We can make a difference in how people think about life and we can make a difference in about how we live life together in community and we can make our worlds a better place. So for me, after 44 years, I still have the drive of making the world a better place. <laughs> and I have seen God change world, people's worlds and in communities. When Jim said, what I can do is work to help people know how to live in a better way in a broken world, well, I've traveled with him. I've seen him do exactly that. Oddly enough, it was during another pandemic, the uh, HIV AIDS crisis back in the 90s. And, you know, it wasn't Jim going out like some superhero striking down the forces of evil. Nah, it was Jim going in the power of the Holy Spirit telling folks there's a better way and that way is Jesus. Yeah, my favorite takeaway from hearing Jim was when he said, 
no matter the education level, if you don't have character, it won't make a difference. Yeah. As in, until you change a person's heart to love, to have compassion, there's no new just law or good policy that will matter or really stick or change anything in society if you don't have character. And only Jesus can change that person. Exactly. Only if you have a changed heart. And Jesus is the one that can change a heart. But how do you know where you fit in? Like your role in the world and where to make a difference. I mean, there's, there's literally, Bob, infinite problems in this world with human failings, natural disasters, injustices aplenty. No kidding. So how do you know, how do you know where God wants you to play your part? And the answer, I think, lies in one word, burden. Every one of us sees something, and it's, it's different for everyone, specific in the world that we can't stand is happening. And we have this, you know, that gut-wrenching personal reaction to that just something must be done about this. And perhaps that's God tugging at you with a special calling. And that's exactly what happened to our next guest, Kathy Douglas. God's calling in a person's life can happen at a very early age, at least for me. I remember that it was a cold winter day and I was wearing a jacket. And as I walked along the sidewalk, I could hear behind me the noise of some boy who was making some noise. And I began to realize that he was teasing me for being Chinese. Now, I'm obviously not Chinese at all, but like I said, I had a hood on and maybe he just mistook me for somebody else. As I turned around and looked at him, he was making Chinese eyes like this. And then he threw a banana peel. And I can remember how the tears came to my eyes as I thought, this isn't fair. I'm not even Chinese. And I also thought, and even if I was Chinese, it still wouldn't be fair. And even at that young age, I kind of had a sense of justice and and that this wasn't right. And although I couldn't think any more, you know, beyond that level at, at age five, but later on, I came to feel like that incident was the time when God put his hand on me and said, I want you to identify with people who are different from you. And that has been a theme throughout my life. I saw here in America that many of us uh, want to stay separate from other people, either out of ignorance of their culture or a little bit of fear or I won't know what to say or maybe there are things that we don't like about a particular people group. You know, we don't like certain habits or cultural uh, attitudes that they have. And so we just keep off from taking that initiative to love our neighbor. And um, I strongly base that on Matthew 9, 35 to 38, where Jesus is obviously being with people uh, in their homes, in the marketplaces, in the places where people gather. He's touching the lepers and being touched uh, by the lepers, the prostitutes. So this is his model for us of how to love people. And that passage tells us that when Jesus saw the, the suffering and the needs, he felt compassion. He didn't feel like, let me stay away from this. This is, this is unpleasant, but rather let, let me go there. Let me meet these needs. So we as his disciples need to be where Jesus is and do what Jesus is doing. If I don't have that kind of compassion, then my faith is worthless. And then as uh, my husband and I got married later and, and felt that the Lord was calling us to Kenya, that calling began to be fulfilled in a very direct way. We identified very deeply with the uh, Kenyan people. Uh, but I used to notice that in the shops, there, the shops were all run by Asians. Uh, that was the term we used in Kenya. And it means people from India and Pakistani descent were there. And uh, I knew they were mostly Hindus, and I knew they needed to hear about Jesus. But uh, I knew that I didn't know anything about uh, that kind of religion or, or culture. And so I used to pray, Lord, send someone, send someone to them, but it's not me, but Lord, do send someone. And I would pretty much leave it at that. And then one day after we had been in Kenya for maybe 11 years and we were living in the town of Nakuru, we, uh, one day a friend of mine came to our, our house and said, uh, Kathy, I've, I've brought a friend of mine, a colleague of mine uh, in the car with me. She's a Sikh, but I think she wants to become a Christian. 
can you witness to her? And in my mind, I thought, what's a Sikh? But with my mouth, I said, sure, bring her in. I, I knew nothing, you see. Um, but God used my ignorance uh, and went beyond that in, into just he worked with his spirit in her life. And uh, she, she was ready, uh, despite my mistakes uh, of that day. And that was the starting of a call from God to really begin to work with and reach the Asian people in Kenya. But the old saying was very, very true in that, in that uh, case, that uh, God will use your availability, not your ability. I had no abilities, no knowledge. And I liken that to um, Peter, uh, the story of Peter and Jesus walking on the water. And when he got out of the boat, he'd never been to walking on water school at all, not one bit. And so it was totally Jesus sustaining him. And uh, in a similar way, uh, I had, I knew nothing, but I just said yes when the Holy Spirit gave me an opportunity. So when you see a need, don't, don't wait for somebody else with more expertise uh, to go in and fill it. But if God has put you there, then His Holy Spirit can give you the power to, to meet that need and to love our neighbors more adequately. I love how Kathy felt that general burden from God to help the different from childhood and then continued to look for opportunities throughout her entire life to carry that out as a calling. I think that's the key to finding your way to change the world. And just trust God will open the doors that you knock on with every beat of those desires in your heart. Oh, yeah. I, I think the most powerful thing uh, Kathy said was simply, I said yes when the Holy Spirit gave me an opportunity. How many times have I missed an opportunity to make a positive difference in someone's life? You know, I hope it's I hope it's not too many, but I'm sure I've missed more than I would ever want to admit. You know, maybe I was too scared or too hesitant or too shy, too selfish. I, maybe I just didn't recognize the opportunity. Man, I pray that I won't miss the next one that comes my way. Well, when, when you said pray, that actually reminds me of another weapon that we have as Christians to make a difference, and, and it's All called right. prayer. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. Kathy, Kathy saw a need with Asians in the community and said, hey, I don't have any idea how or who, but God, could you help? And, and just think, we're talking to God, creator of everything. We have been given direct communication with that God who wants us to call him Father to ask him for things. And if it's something God put in your heart as a burden to care about, of course he cares too. And if God can't make a difference in the world, we don't have a chance, right? No, so, not at all. Right. No. So don't forget the power we have to communicate and ask God for things that we know in ourselves we can't do. And then the best part is with Kathy, sometimes God says like he did with her, hey, Kathy, I've decided the answer is you. I'm yeah. going to send you and give you the right words to say that you didn't even know you had because I'm God with you. And he has built things in, in each of us that we don't even know about. He's put strengths and gifts in us that a lot of times we don't recognize. And he wants to use those to help others. Right. And then, and with God, you really can be the one to make a difference. And like Kathy, when God gives you the opportunity, take it. Absolutely. Now, our last guest is someone who certainly did not miss a huge opportunity. Mike Christian and his wife, Judy, are missionaries in Thailand. They were working with university students on December 26, 2004. That's the day of the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami. In 2004, Southeast Asia experienced a tsunami. It was huge. Over 200,000 people died. Ten days later, we took five buses to southern Thailand. And there were 250 people on those five buses. And I remember, I'll never forget this, we drove through the debris 
barely able to drive these big buses through the roads. And I remember to the day, to the day, that when I stepped off that bus, stepped my foot on the ground, God just ripped my heart out. And he said to me, Mike, these people are hurting. You need to help these people. I remember asking God, what is it that I can do? And I remember in Ban Numkem, the village that we started working in, it was a village of about 7,000 people. 3,000 people died within an hour and gone through horrendous pain. And we saw the way that we could help them was the families were just trying to find the bodies. That was such a, such a need because the government just didn't have the ability to care or take care or find these bodies. So I was so proud of our students and some of our staff that said, we will stop, we will stay, we will help. And they did. Now, was it easy for them? No, by no way, shape, or form. Very, very difficult. But we began to think, how could we help these people that were hurting? Remember the first group we went to? There were 50 families living under the stars. Their whole village had been destroyed. Now, living under the stars, if you're going camping and want to see the beautiful sky, that's fine. But it's when it's rainy season in Thailand, living under the stars with your family, nothing to protect you. We really saw a huge need. So we began to build houses, bought some land, built some houses. I think we built 200 houses since we started. They're very makeshift little houses, but they're a roof over their heads. And they ask you about why is it that you're here? And we began to share with them, uh, well, Jesus has asked us to come and help you. And they said, oh, Jesus, who's that? So we wanted to put a body to Jesus, that we could be a Jesus to people that had never heard his name. I remember we had set up a center to help people. In the newspaper, when they asked them, why aren't you going to the, to the Buddhist ceremony? And they said, well, my fan was given to me by a Christian. The rice that we needed right away, the Christians brought. The chickens that we ate, the Christians helped us. And now the Christians are out there helping us to rebuild our houses. And we want what they have. And we now know that what they have is Jesus. So I think if I were to challenge someone else when they see or they're around people that are in pain, we need to come alongside helping them in any way you can. If I see somebody that their car's broken down or see somebody that their, their houses have been destroyed, I wanna get involved. Get a hammer out, get some nails. Let's put this thing back together. And I think that's the way that we really can be Jesus to other people. So when we said, we will do this, we will help, we were able to put a body to Jesus. That's one of my favorite stories, actually. Oh, yeah. It is such a powerful story. If you're not familiar with the 2004 tsunami, please check out our video on it. Matt, you did a great job editing it. Thanks. Thanks. I'll post a link to it in our show notes. What really grabs me is that people who, for the most part, had never even heard the name of Jesus saw him for the first time in the hearts and actions of his followers. Right. They saw him in the Christians selflessly caring for them at a time of their greatest need. And because of that, they wanted to know him. Yeah, Mike was just a great example of see the need, feel the burden, most importantly, go. Yeah. And then even when the problem looks and is so much bigger than little old you and little old Mike, trust that God will give you what you need to walk on water, like Kathy talked about earlier, and let Jesus work through you. It doesn't take a cataclysmic event for us to step in and make a difference in the world. No. In fact, our greatest opportunities are right in front of us every day. 
Yeah, it could be as simple as checking on an, the elderly widow who is having difficulty going to the grocery store or comforting someone who is grieving or encouraging that kid you see who's trying to accomplish his or her dreams or feeding a homeless person. When you do that, you are showing Jesus to that person. Yeah. And that's how you make a difference in the world. Jim said it best when he said Christianity makes a difference. We can make a difference in how people think about life. And we can make a difference about how we live life together in community. Mm -hmm. And we can make our world a better place. And Kathy reminded us once again that God doesn't throw us into these situations alone. If he puts a need in front of us, then his Holy Spirit will give us the power we need to go out there and love our neighbors. And finally, Mike showed us that when we serve others, we are being Jesus to those people. Right. And for me, my burden has always been wanting to connect the dots for people, seeing humanity with God as one body with many parts, as, as Paul talks about in Corinthians, that, that we're all different. We have different roles, different perspectives, but together with God, we can love and help change the world. And so that desire that beats you know, daily in my heart, along with the passion for editing and telling stories through the camera and audio, that's where God led me right here, talking to all of you. And it's been yep. an absolute honor and pleasure to watch God give me a voice to help make a difference in people's lives. And since this is our last episode of season one, we will be back in season two, but since yeah. this is our last episode of season one, I want to take a moment to thank you, Matt, <laughs> for tackling this project when neither of us knew what in the world we were doing as far as <laughs> podcasting goes. I also need to give a huge thanks to Mary Mattingly, mm -hmm. whose contributions are innumerable. She gives us great advice and keeps us on track and on schedule, and she helped review the legacy videos. She's incredible. Yep. And with that, I also want to thank Larry Hauer and Andy Hauer, who have helped us in so many ways with our audio, mm -hmm. recording us, uh, except these last two. <laughs> <laughs> well, they could yeah. probably tell the difference without them. <laughs> oh, no kidding. But recording us and... Um, coaching us and covering our mistakes mm -hmm. and helping us even get on the air. Right. Thanks to Graphite Man for our opening and closing music, who happens to be my nephew. And finally, I want to take a moment to remember Bailey Mark Sr., yes. our friend and mentor. Uh, our website legacy was Bailey's dream and is part of the legacy he's handed down to you, to me, to all of us. Bailey was someone who lived out the kind of life we talk about in 78.4. And he graduated to heaven just as we launched this podcast. He was greatly loved and will be greatly missed. Yes, he will. Our hope with 78.4 is that it'll help you flourish in your relationship with Jesus. That's why we include the links to articles and tools in our, our show notes as a way of helping you grow in him and becoming a real difference in someone's life. So please, check out our show notes. Yeah, and the audio you heard today comes from some of the more than 400, I think we're nearing 500, and growing videos on our website, legacy.crew.org. That's legacy.cru.org. We also have a YouTube channel called Crew Legacy and a Facebook page, so please check it out. And if you like today's podcast, we ask that you please subscribe. So whenever we come back for season two, you'll know and get it sent right to you. Also, please rate us so we know how we're doing. And tell your friends about us. They can binge all the episodes while we're still trapped in our homes. And again, throughout the dog <laughs> days of the summer on the way. Yes, please. <laughs> 784 is a podcast of legacy, a project of crew. Thanks for listening. We'll be back, God willing, in the fall hopefully September, with season two. And while we're away, we want to encourage you, as always, to remember that whatever God did in the lives of the people you heard speak today, he can do in you. So, until we're together again, go out there and continue the legacy.